What's happening, people? It's your girl, Mina. Welcome back to my channel, man. You already know what it is, first and foremost. Big up to everyone in the chat. I hope you're having a wonderful uh, Wednesday. I think it's Wednesday. And big up Marcel. It's been a minute since he's been here. It's been a minute since we have, we've been able to chop it up. And a lot has happened in the last, I think it's been two weeks since our last stream. Um, yeah, yeah. But how you doing, bro? How, how, how you been? How you been? I'm, I'm good, thank you. Obviously, you know, it's been difficult for us to, to get the time together to do this. But, you know, I've been busy here and there, here and there. It's difficult for us to connect. But, yeah, looking for looking forward to today's debate looking forward to today's chat you know update on certain things and i've been good i've been good um you know how have you been i've been good man i've been good big up to everyone last day of ramadan today 30 days just mm. gone that quickly so it's going to be eid tomorrow i'm going to try my best to do an eid day stream but i don't know if i'm going to be capable of doing that just because spending time with family and yeah. you know all of that stuff but but big up to everyone um oh my god it's tuesday i said i said happy wednesday, wednesday. but it's yeah. tuesday today that's how you don't know i'm just like i'm it's just not here. i'm mm -hmm. not here like it's fasting brain isn't it i'm hungry i'm not thinking properly but happy tuesday guys i'm sorry for that error um and on the note of happy tuesday john murto officially has stepped down from his role as football director at manchester united this is not a surprise i don't think it's a surprise we we've, we've known this has been coming especially with Ineos shaking everything up how do you mm. feel about just Murto leaving? And and what what would you rate his time in terms of? Uh, he's been at the club for eleven years. He's held he's held multiple positions. Last summer, the summer before that, I was hearing Murto madness during the summer transfer windows. The madness ain't really is not it's not really madness. It's, it wasn't really madness. How would you make of his time just at Manchester United in in the director role in particular? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really good question because, like you say, you know, over the course of 11 years, what have we really been able to ascertain or or, or achieve within those 11 years? And, and if we look at, you know, the direction of football in terms of signings and, and those kind of things, you know, a lot of them have been have broken down to a degree over the course of 10 years or we've overspent, overpaid kind of players. So I think it was a culture within Manchester United's football club to kind of promote within within the club to a degree that's why you know certain people have been able to you know hold roles at the club you know Richard Arnold I think even even the likes of David Gill they, they, they you know obviously we purchased you know business people but they got promotions within the football club I think Ineos coming in now are changing that structure trying to get the best in class available instead of promoting in-house whereas you know our competition you know uh, Arsenal uh, City they've always tried to especially when the new managers come in they're trying to get the best in class or the best structure suited for that particular manager so it's a change of um of a behavior within our club in terms of you know getting rid of the people that over the course of you know Omar Barada is looking at it in two-year increments but you know we as Manchester United have been doing it for 10 years you know or you know all of a sudden Darren Fletcher a player gets a run I'm not dissing that I think that's that's one of those good moves because it's someone that's an actual football person and that you know knows about the football club loves the football club that's you know, being promoted into a high position once their career is done. But, you know, in terms of the business people, Richard Arnold, John Murta, for a long period of time now, especially as we're able to look at that and, and we have that history there, it's it's been one of those things where we can see that, it, unfortunately, for a long period of time, he hasn't been able to, to produce anything for us, really, you know, in terms of pushing, you know, making the right decisions of our football direction and getting us into that first, second position in the Premier League and, and re what we all really want, a Champions League and, and consistency in terms of competing at the top level. Very, very happy about this news, but at the same time, you don't like to hear someone within our club losing their job which is also a kind of a, a sad, difficult thing. But at the end of the day, we have to be cutthroat now. And, and for us to make good decisions over the course of the next 10 years, it's one of those things where you have to get, you know, some these, a lot of this structure has to be taken out. It's not just Murto actually leaving. It's reported today as well that Rafael Varane is set to leave the club probably in the summer as well. United are not, apparently United have made a decision. It's not been reported by like David Ornstein or anyone. So I'm, I'm taking it with a pinch of salt. But it's mm. been rumoured for the last couple of months that, you know, he probably wouldn't stay. Do you think that's yeah. the right decision out of all the centre-backs that United have to let Varane be the one that kind of uh, bites the bullet and, and, and walks? You know, you know, I just, I, I was before, you know, a few months back, especially on our show, though, you know, I've, I've been saying, oh, you know, uh, Varane needs to go. I know, and a lot of people have changed their mind. You've changed my mind on it in terms of, is that the best kind of look to, to in terms of, the, the situation where we're at, you know, he's a very good box defender. 
he's French. Camboala, who's got a lot of potential, someone to, to to grow and mature through the ranks, someone to look up to, someone that's, you know, got a bigger claim, big reputation, Varane I'm talking about, in the in, in football. The, the issue there is the wages. Again, the Edward Woodward's, the, the Edward Woodness, you know, purchasing the player at that astronomical wage, not really looking long term, you know, heavily injury prone. I know I was saying before, can he make 70% of the games within a season? This season he's been quite good. I mean, last season wasn't so strong, but this season he has been really good, Mina. So, you know, on review or when you look at it again, I'm thinking, oh, you know, maybe keep him on on a lower wage, a couple more years can definitely be useful for us. But I, I would be sad to see him go when I see him perform. But at times, Mina, I look at that relationship between him and Ten Hag, some, it just doesn't always feel 100% right. Um, you know, nobody's bigger than the club, Ten Hag and the players. Can we get a new... Uh, you know, French robust centre back similar to to Varane, and I think he can maybe cultivate that out of Kambala, someone that looks like very passionate and loves the club. So, it's, it's it would be a bad decision for the player though. I think he's left international football, so he's available more now for 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 domestic football, and 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 we seem to love him at this club. Well, I definitely have grown to 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 understand his use outside of just playing every single week, and and I think he, it would be a bad decision, but. We have to make these cutthroat decisions. If we're keeping Maguire instead of Varane, big mistake. If we're keeping Lindelof, oh, we are keeping we keep, we are keeping Maguire. We are keeping Lindelof. Sorry, yeah, oh, we are. It's, it's well, Lindelof had, has had his one year extension um, triggered for next for next year. Varane hasn't, which is why Varane is leaving on a free. It's not even like United are selling him; he's leaving for free. Yeah, I, I think I think financial. So for 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 Lindelof, and I think the clubs always drag their heels on this one in terms of we've taken so long to renew contracts. Bruno, Rashford, Pogba, it's just poor business. These are these are business people trying to do marketable kind of deals, and 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 football people now, best in class footballing people, don't wait for Lindelof to get to his end of contract, and then you see him going on a free. Get him, okay? Yes, it has to be a lesser price because he's just not going to reach that creme de la creme level, but. You know, we should be we should be shipping that off. You know, but I think that hopefully that's what the year extension is for. You know, he's still gonna retain some sort of value instead of it being six or eight months into the contract ex, uh, finishing. And and hopefully we can sell him on. You know, he has to be one of those players. If you keep Lindelof has no off, value to sell him on for anything. I personally don't. I don't think you're getting more than ten million. Oh, and I would be happy to take it, you know. I, I honestly, you know, you know, Sancho, I wanted gone at the beginning of the season, you know, before the season commenced. Uh, Martial, I wanted the se- him gone before the season commenced. I was saying take 20 million, 25 if you can for Maguire. They're, they're surplus to requirements in terms of what our manager wants for his model and his shape and, and the crazy kind of total football basket match, rock and roll kind of style football that he wants to create. But he needs the right players for that. Get rid of these players. That, that for me, Mina, is is holistic backing. You know, we can, you know, even if it's at a cut price, we can see that this player, especially for this style of football, Lindelof, has he got the recovery place on the halfway line? Even Varane is an issue, but we're just seeing the great box defending. That's really, really good. And the maturity. So where do you the game. replace that then with, with, with Varane? Because I feel like with Lindelof, he has traits that are replaceable. Whereas with Varane, he's got some traits. I'm not saying he's not replaceable, but I'm just saying, you know, if I had a young player coming through an academy, an academy system, system like Kambwala and you know we're looking to buy young players like Branthwaite, like Tadebo, like Adarabayo. Varane is the one that I would want them to learn under. That's who, mm. that's who I would want them to learn on under Rafael Varane, and and not just in in terms of his ability and what he does on the pitch, but just his sportsmanship off the pitch. I mean, mm. if you've watched, I don't want to reference it, but you know, if you've watched Paul Pogba's documentary uh, on Amazon, Rafael Varane was a big part of you know, being the voice in the dressing room, the voice of reason, you know, the Pogba confi- confided him in, in him a lot. Um, I've seen players do interviews where they talk about which players, you know, uh, maintain a high level of, you know, professionalism at the club right now. People mention Casemiro's, the Brunos, but they mention Varane and Varane goes under the radar a lot because aesthetically, I feel like he doesn't look like a aesthetically good defender. I mean, he looks awkward on the ball. He runs a bit weird. But he's a great defender, like, and I don't think anyone can can really dispute that. Especially, and I think the whole narrative of oh he's injury prone, I think that's a very lazy narrative to have about about Rafael Varane. He's had injury problems, that's for sure. He's definitely had it. But this year, he's been more available than he probably has not been available, bar the times when he's missed a game or two to injury, or he was beefing the manager. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you totally now, and I definitely had to change my narrative on terms of his availability. I don't think maybe you know go as he as he gets older and his body breaks down a little bit more, you know he 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 might become a bit more injury prone. But definitely keeping him along the squad, like for the reasons that you've stated, you know that the, the other players, young centre backs coming through, and even the ones that we're going to purchase, Todibo, Brantway, whoever it is, Kim Min Jae potentially, obviously he's at Bayern and that didn't transpire, but whoever it is that comes through, even the good partnership with Martinez. It just, in terms of a business decision, I can understand because it's a very high wage that we're carrying with him. Um, but if they were able to get those negotiations sorted, you know, Lindelof and Maguire seem like players that just won't be able to reach that Varane level. Even though Maguire has been good this season, I just think long term, we're asking the footballers to, to do. Even Rand can't do it to the to the extent, but he just has so much experience that we want to be able to soak up and, and take from him at his latter stages of his career. Um, really, really upset that that hasn't been utilised or thought about thoroughly. Um, there's so many other options that we could have get rid of in, in the market in terms of like that centre-back position that I think are more important in terms of priority to get off the books. Big up to everyone. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to uh, subscribe. Guys, if you want to join the membership club, you can. It's the pinned comment in the chat. You get your badges, you get emojis, custom mem member content. Of course, you get to support the growth of the channel. If you've got any questions or any comments, you can send them in with Super Chats and we'll debate it or we'll talk about it or we'll address it. Um, I need to go on to, I think, the, the, the part that you just mentioned now about Lissandro Martinez. Are you worried? Because I've, I've been watching the full review the last couple of weeks. I ain't been on it, but I've been mm. watching you and Kenny going back and back um about Lissandro Martinez and he, uh, Kenny's been adamant that Lissandro Martinez has been a bad signing yeah um, I mean where do we miss that firstly we miss you on the full view I don't know where you've been but obviously I, I haven't one. been on because um it, it clashes with when we break off us so I yeah, can't, yeah, I can't yeah. be on and then leave so around the seven eight and, times yeah, six, so seven, eight time. yeah, yeah I haven't been on but I'll be back next week on the full view I'll yeah back. okay so that's that, that's good we, we need you on there but um Martinez I don't know. It's, his playing ability is so important in terms of what happens in the back line, the defensive line, and, and pushing in into the midfield line. Ten Hag wants the footballers to be proactive and step in, from in especially in the defensive line, because we have that massive issue with the midfield always trying to add themselves to a press. Um, and on and, and especially when we're breaking lines or starting up attacks, you know, Ten Hag wants us to really add as many bodies into the forward line or in the opposition's path, uh, uh, in the opposition's half as much as possible. Um, Martinez though is breaking down a lot, a lot of miscellaneous, I would say, injuries in terms of the, you know, a footballer, West Ham Sufal, I think it was Kufal, I think his name is, you know, yeah. landing on his knee, um, you know, uh, the foot injuries being a bit miscellaneous, and 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 the and the medical staff this season, uh, I've I've been told that it was an ex Arsenal medical staff person who's been really. What are you saying? He's working against us. <laughs> work, oh, Mina, working against us massively, you know, trying to absolutely hinder us this season, astronomical and and decimated our squad with the amount of injuries and he's been telling Ten Hag ex-players meant to come back at this point and when you know when that time comes they're not ready or you know they break down again so we haven't been evaluating our footballers properly Ten Hag has highlighted that as well and, and with Martinez somebody that I think in the first season was really yes he's small in terms of stature um, but Cannavaro a, a Ballon d'Or winner not saying Martinez will reach that point but he could do because he's won the World Are Cup. Are you not worried, though, about these injuries that he's picked up? Because I remember, like, a couple months back, you know, when he got injured, like, the end of last year, at the end of the calendar year last year. Mm -hmm. um, I remember on the full view, I was saying that we should leave him to just sit the rest of the season out and come back fresh next season. And people didn't agree with me, but I was just worried that, again, because he's irritated an injury twice now, at that point from the injury that he picked up last year. I was just concerned that he might pick up another injury. Of course, it's not like for like injury, but I'm just worried that some players get rushed back. You you see Mason Mount, and this is, you know, going to lead me to, to talk about the manager, of course, because that we'll, we have to talk about him. Um, yeah, yeah. Mason Mount's been kind of eased back into the team. You know, he's eased back into rotation. He's getting a couple appearances here through su substitution roles. Obviously, he's come off the back of a, of a long injury. Whereas when mm -hmm. other players have come back from a long injury, they just get, bam, thrown back into the first team. And I think that's desperation from the manager because Luke Shaw paid, played like five or six 90 minutes in a row coming off of uh, an injury and then got injured again. Uh, Lissandro Martinez, in my opinion, didn't need to play against Brentford. I don't think he needed to. But I think it's desperation from the manager to just have certain pieces of his puzzle available to to kind of change the way that you know United play rather than just changing the way that United play to to support what he has at that 
you know, moment because, you know, we're going to talk about the games over the last week. Three games, mm -hmm. walking away with two points when you were in a winning position in every single game. That's poor. And I don't yeah. think people are, like, emphasising enough on it that three games in a row you were in a leading position and you threw it away. Now, some of it cannot be blamed on the manager. I 100% agree. But then, for example, the one, the Liverpool game, I feel like once you took Garnacho off and brought on Amrabat to kind of like shut up shop, I think that invites pressure from the opponent. And that kind of indicates to the opponent that for the next 15 or so minutes, you're going to sit back. You're not going to try score. Obviously, you know, United had chances, didn't put it away. Uh, Brentford game, you know, I don't even know how United managed to get a point from that Brentford game. We were so bad. United were mm. so, so bad. And, you know, one win, in six Premier League wins, and you're still saying that United can finish in the top four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, maybe not the top four now. I would say the fifth, fifth position. I, I was saying before that third is still possible, and numerically, I don't know if it still is now, but I still believe fifth Champions League basically man, is is still something that we have to, we really have to have in our minds. I that it's something that we can still amass the points for, um, and and it's still numerically possible, and I believe that we can achieve it. It's the the style of football that I think that we should be trying to play to achieve that is different from what Ten Hag's doing now, but he's still trying to push his game model onto the players that he's going to maybe new, utilize for the rest of the season and and for the and and for and beyond that point so um but in terms of martinez i think you're right maybe it is an element of desperation and and him wanting to cuz once you lose martinez the drop off in the quality of the next player or once you lose um you know luke shaw or mason mount hoyland has come in and out of the game and and that means we don't have a recognized striker you, you lose so much elements of the shape and how he wants the model and the, and, and the 11 to play i think he's you know as soon as someone as soon as he's been told oh x players back he wants to just put them in for the 20 30 minutes and you are right certain positions have been and certain positions and certain players within those positions have been the desperation hasn't been so much because you know it's not been as decimated in the back line as it has in the midfield line he can still have different parts to the puzzle or utilize the players available to him in a different way within the model but you know it's just been absolutely a difficult situation to manage and and when you have i think sometimes the player is is not part to blame but they have a passion or, the, uh, or a desire to want to play for the team then the medical staff are always uh, are also saying he's available to a certain degree and then tenog has a decision to make with two people saying yes and then is he really going to say no to martinez wanting to play re-injures himself again and then you're in that horrible cycle i think well, you're, you're, the, you're the manager you should make that decision if you don't think adequate uh, that that player is available to an extent in terms of fitness wise i mean eric ten hag he 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 talks a lot about match fitness when it comes to players coming back from injury so why is that not applicable to people like lisandro martinez where you know he's clearly not match fit but he can mm. still come into a game um he's only been training on the grass for a week or so it's 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 kind of like his priorities are, are all over the place. And, and I said it's desperation, but I think it's actually a bit more than desperation. I think this is a man that knows that every game counts in terms of for his job, for his dignity. And because he's placed so much emphasis, I think, on the importance of a player like Lissandro Martinez, I just feel like he's just out there kind of, you know, patiently waiting for him to come back. And, and the second he's available the, to put on boots, he's dashing him into the team. Whereas I think it's double... The, the point I'm trying to make is that I think it's double standards when it comes to players come, some players coming back from injury and some other players coming back from injury where, you know, Kobe Maino, he, he said that he had to be eased in and out of the team back in November because he had just come back off of, you know, a, an, an injury. Lissandro mm -hmm. Martinez easily multiple times coming back off a, of a long injury and especially that injury that he had last season, you know, coming back into pre-season, aggravating it again, you know, it's just double standards. The way that he treats the players when it comes to injury. And you're right, medical staff are, are, are deceiving him. They are deceiving him. But, you know, there's no issue with Marcus Rashford playing through injury. Marcus, Marcus Rashford has been playing through injury since that Nottingham Forest game back in like December. He's been playing through an injury, through through a, through a rib injury, I think, and now yeah. he's got a hip injury as well. Apparently, he's he's been having hip problems. This is a player that's been playing through injury. I think is, I think it's player negligence. I actually think at that point it's play, player negligence. I, 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 I'm going to strongly disagree with it because it just the, the, the 25, 26, whatever it is, players available to him, they're all seeming to break down. I really kind of 
almost all at once almost it feels like you know and 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 is you know 20 something different combinations in the back line you know it's just and then match fitness for me there's like two types of fitness there's the match fitness and there's your actual fitness but to build your match fitness you need to pay matches so when any you do you do to, to build match fitness you need to have a consistent amount of games and then it's like you get the feel for the tempo to understand the game where to put your feet in the ground all these little things that come with match fitness for me and he's trying to build it incrementally but some players they're just breaking down again and I don't think it's player negligence to a degree because I, if I was in that position as Martinez I've been telling the manager every single time yes I want to play I want to play or maybe sometimes I'm not. But when I'm telling him I want to play, I think that gives him more conviction to play me. Then the medical staff are also following with that ilk. That's giving more conviction. And then is Ten Hag going to really go with two? No and he's going to want to play his best players. So it's almost like two and a half yeses. And then his no, like what you're, what, like what you're saying, is he's got to be sensible in terms of the long-term proliferation of the player for the club, You know, their, their long-term fitness, their, their, the risk of actually injuring themselves again. But, but like I say, Mena, that... Once you replace these kind of key elements, a Cass, uh, and I don't think Cass is good enough to continue playing for the club, but even him right now within the within the context of this season, you know, once you take out these types of players, the the the, the next one coming in, are they not they're either unproved, not proven enough, not good enough, they've 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 got match fitness issues. It's just a massive soup of so many different negative issues this season, and 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 I've, I've it's it's been very difficult for him to manage it, but. If we can get into that Champions League or, or finish in, in and around these positions, I think it will benefit us. And it would be a good season, I think, from for Ten Hag. You know, to finish, the joke's thing is, to finish, uh, for United to get that fifth spot in Champions League, we need Arsenal and City to do well in the Champions League. Is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need the English teams to do well. Uh, I've got a question for you, and I've got a question also for, for the audience as well. What do you think has been the biggest issue for United this year in terms of the way that they're playing. Do you think it's been the manager's inability to change or adapt to situations in games? Uh, do you think it's been solely because of injuries? Or do you think it's solely on the ability of the players that are available? So, you know, we, we sit here all the time talking about how certain players are not capable, they're, they're not technical enough, they're not this, they're not that. What do you think has been the biggest part of the way that the season has played out? Um, so I don't think it's just one thing, but but like you said, the the biggest thing, and and I, maybe it needs to go in in, in order of priority or, or in order of biggest issue, you know, because it's a combination of things, even things that Tenog's inherited, you know, uh, that brings that 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 comes into a position where this culture is still festering, you know, player power kind of culture and and players not being kind of you know, um, professional enough. I know we spoke about Varane's elite professionalism, but a player that we could utilize like Sancho, you know, not being professional enough for, for this kind for this level of, of football. But what I would say is it's a combination of the players not being injured. The new game model or the new way that Tenox trying to set us out on the football pitch, you know, is something that we need to adapt to in a teething period of that. And um it's it's almost like we've gone you know, last season he he brought a level of stability and expectation. You know that it's results based, and and that's why we're even now the desperation comes from every single game's a final a little bit. So it's very important every single game that feeling for every single game that we play. But I, I would say it's a combination of the injuries because none at any point in the back line, I don't think he's had his starting lineup for 10, 20 games, and I think all the other clubs that are above us have had that to a degree. Um, so that. The manager in game management is a, is an issue this season. I think last season he had a bit of the Midas touch in terms of any time he brings somebody on, something happens. He, he he comes into a position where he gets results. But this season, you know, decisions make putting on players on too late. His own purchases in terms of Amrabat haven't really worked out. Other players that he's put trust in, Anthony, haven't really worked out. Even though I have been saying he scores big goals, Anthony, and he has done that again for us. But across 38 games, it, it just hasn't been enough. The players that he's thrown his hat on, or that Manchester United trust, Rashford, Bruno, haven't really delivered again in terms of, in, especially within what we want them to do in this game model. Um, at the end of the day, I think it's, it's definitely the injuries, though, for me, it's the main one. Because, you know, when players are not available, you're not able to build the routines to get the, the rhythm and the flow within the team. You can't build runs on that, you know, and, 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 and that's been a massive issue for us, I think. I think it's, it's harsh for me to say this, but in the two games this season that we did have, or Ten Hag did have his players available to him. Um, it was the first two games of the season. I see no difference in the Wolves game and the uh, Spurs game at the beginning of the season. And maybe like now, I think obviously it's gotten worse. The situation has 
gotten worse but I don't think there was any sort of um identifiable traits in those games where I felt okay I can see the manager's handprints in this starting 11 of course I think Rasmus Hoyland didn't actually play until like Arsenal uh, but even then if we talk about Rasmus Hoyland last three games he's been stinking the pitch up bro he has been stinking the place up he has he he's He's showing his inexperience, I guess, when it comes to being a young player and having, you know, the 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 the, the reliance on his shoulders as being the number nine player. But these are examples of, you know, I mean, it took until Hoyle, Hoyle won Player of the Month um, last month. He, yeah. he he won it in March. That is the first person this season who was signed in the summer to win Player of the Month. So it's taken mm-hmm. until March for a new signing to win Player of the Month. And, you know, who else did we sign? Mason Mount didn't really see much of him this season. Yeah. Andre Anana, I think he's having a very fluctuating season. It's, it's up, his, his season's up and down. There's goals that he's conceding that he shouldn't be. And then there's massive saves he's pulling off in that same game. Um, Sufian Amrabat, unfortunately, I think he's just bottom of the pecking order. Once you're after Scott McTominay in that list, I don't think you are ever, ever, ever going to be a, a starting player, unfortunately. And he's yeah. another player who I think in another... I don't want to be like in another lifetime, but I think in another situation, he might have worked out. It's like, you yeah. know, like uh, Jaden Sancho, I think in another situation, had he not come in the same summer as Ronaldo, you know, it might have worked out differently because had Ronaldo not come, Jaden Sancho with, you know, Cavani, Rashford, it might have been different. It, that yeah. whole situation could have been different. But I think Amrabat is another player, I think, in another situation, um, it might be different. But I do think that we can say injuries is, is a part of it, which, you know, is in, inexcusable. We can say, you know, players' abilities or, you know, lack of understanding of, of how the manager wants to play, that is a part of it. But I do think a big part of it is the manager's stubbornness. He's a very stubborn man where he doesn't want to change. He It's like he's, he's adamant that, things will work in a situation when we have seen time and time again, it won't work. And for me, the biggest part that's telling of it is that Wolves and Spurs at the beginning of the season, we saw the midfield problem. We saw the midfield problem right in front of our eyes. And we are all the way now in April. I've stopped talking about the midfield because it's just pointless. But we're all the way in April. And that issue is still there. It's evident that it never worked. And I remember when, when we signed Mason Mount and I and I did a stream and I said, how is Mason Mount going to fit into this midfield um, where we have, obviously at the time we had Casemiro, it wasn't Kobe Mano, but, you know, we have Casemiro and, you know, Casemiro can't play as a lone six. And that is still applicable to Kobe Mano. Kobe Mano is not a six, firstly, but even if he plays mm. as a six, he cannot play as a lone six and he shouldn't have to do that. And in the Liverpool game, for example, I think it was more telling because Liverpool's midfield was kind of half-half where, you know, McAllister was running the show and Endo was putting in a shift and Soboslai was sh- crap. But, yeah. you know, there was so much space available to them. And yeah. and and I realised it's all because of the manager, because even with the way that United press, I don't know if you see, you know, the pressing when it comes to the front line, you'll see Bruno pressing aggressively. You'll see Hoyland pressing, you know, the goalkeeper if he's got the ball. You'll see the wingers are always confused whether they should press the fullbacks or press the centre-backs. And if they press the centre-backs, well, the goalkeeper is just going to play a pass to the full-back. The full-back is going to play a pass to the midfield and they're on the break. And Liverpool did that countless of times. And and I think Carragher was pointing it out as well during the game where they were like, why is Kobe being instructed to overcommit in the press? Is leaving Casemiro all by himself. At times, there was points of the, in the game where even Casemiro was like pressing. So now the gap between the back line and the front line is huge. And I know you're going to say players like Maguire is the reason this is happening because, you know, they can't play a high line, you know, so, they, so they're playing deeper. So the gap between the midfield and the and the, and the, and the defence is, is huge. But if you know that your defender doesn't have the legs to do that and you insist on them playing a bit deeper, then why are you still telling your midfield to press so high? And why are you still leaving those gaps? So what what the, the difference between you know Ten Hag and Deserbi and, and this is why I've been on onto Deserbi is because he's very strict on these principles where he will fo- he will send he will send the player out there and demand that it's done that way into infinity. Ten Hag is still doing that, but he's trusting the player's feeling in the situation. He said this before that he's trusting the players, you know, when having the temperament and the understanding of when to step in. So, so when you're talking about that press and 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 the the fullbacks for uh, and and the the right or the left 
uh, player, the right left midfielder, having to press either a centre back or a full back. Well, if he presses a centre back, then our full backs, Manchester United full backs, need to go in and press up higher to close them passing lanes for the for the full back potentially, or or the or and leave their right winger. Um, and then sometimes even when it's centrally coming in, because I did rem you're talking about the Liverpool game specifically, I think there was times though where Maguire does come into the midfield line and then goes for their highest uh, Liverpool's highest midfielder, whether that's Slobosai or uh, Ant McAllister or Endo. There is times where he does that, and then there is also a time against Fulham where he does do that, but he gets caught out against Traore. And then Eriksson's also in the team there, but he hasn't got the endurance and the legs, so. I'm, I, I can see what the manager is doing, but again, the, he doesn't have the players that have the ability to do this. Once the team has, once we got more functional players and are able to work in tandem, the reason why they're not able to work in tandem, multiple reasons, injuries that, that you know they haven't, there hasn't been a consistent fifteen players always selected every week. So once all these little habits are in place, I think the whole way that the press will look will be a lot better. I think the quality of footballer is so paramount, especially in that back line. They're starting build-ups and they're also keeping the opposition in their half, in, in their in the opposition's half. So, you know, that trust of, of when Kobe does go and, and goes higher up into the press, you need centre-backs. Martinez was good at it last season of just closing that, that gap. We also need players that can trust all the space in behind because top teams, or every single top team does this. They risk all the space in behind and they're trying to close it into a half-court game. Our team have never really played in that kind of style of football, man. So that you know, they then they're, they're they're learning it because last season we weren't even doing that. This season our line is definitely much higher than last season. So they're gonna have a teething period or a period where it's just not gonna look right until you get the right pieces of the puzzles in, in my opinion. And and I can clearly see those players that can't do it. Some kind of can do it, but that you know, they need more games, I think, you know, within this kind of un a setup. Ten Hag, to a degree, though, has kind of reverted back to what he was playing last season against Burnley, against Sheffield this season, where we had one nil or poor results. But it's because, you know, he didn't feel confident maybe in outlaying the team like this. I think, you know, coming towards the end of the season now, he needs to maybe still kind of push this kind of system so that they have a kind of a, a basis point to work on, get see the players that are not good enough, get rid of them. And then you think he should you think he should still persist with this style of football? I So... I, from what I've seen, ten. This is not ten hot. Like he's been instructed to do the things this way. You know, this has been an outlet. Like Ineos are happy with this style of football. You know, from what I've been seeing and reading. And, you know, somebody let me know if, if that's incorrect. But from what I've been seeing and reading, man, this is something that he's also been instructed. You know, Ineos understand what it is that we're trying to do and the style of football. And I hope that is positive signs in terms of they know that these players are inadequate in these kind of conditions. You know, they haven't been demanded to play this kind of style of football before. This is very high risk, high reward football. It's the most attractive type of football. So, I, uh, you know, that that that's a massive issue that Tenog's inherited. Certain footballers aren't astronomical wages and have certain conditions, I, I believe, in their contracts that allow them to, to be playing on the pitch for a certain amount of times or throughout oh, the season. On, you, can't say, you can't say that. You can't, you can't say that I, players have a contractual right, basically, to be playing. Well, well, so what well, you're saying, people like who? Give me a suggestion of who you think has a contractual right to be playing I, I would, a certain number of minutes. I, I, would say, I would say to a degree Marcus Rashford. You know, even though he's, yeah, even though he's been playing so, uh, so poorly or... or up and down throughout a season, I think, I'd, I, and and maybe not just a contractual right as well. But if it's not a contractual right, it's it's the PR, it's the money you're paid to pay this player every single week. You know those kind of real basic understandings. He's on the biggest wage. He's been more. He's the most professional player. You know, Maguire, Rashford, Bruno. They're the senior. Casemiro, Varane. These are senior players that you're meant to have to. You you're meant to be playing them out every week. This is why we paid them. So it's an element of that, and I think to a degree, I'm sh I'm not sure because you will never know, but there is a degree of a contractual right there for me as well. Or there could be, and I wouldn't be surprised if there was. Mina, is what I'm saying. I don't know. I think I think I think that's a that's a hot take. I think yeah, I think that's a hot take in terms of. Um, I think I think Bruno with players like Bruno and Rashford. I think those are players that the managers feel like they can rely on. Now, whether we think that they should be relied on or not, that's a different. But you know, th these managers are seeing stuff in training that we don't see. You know, mm. we don't see that. I have a question for you. Would you stick with Ten Hag for another year? Because he's got one year left on his contract. 
And obviously, I think the decision will be made by Ineos. I think they'll make the decision at the end of the season. So once football is done and everything, I think they've, they're they already making that progress now. Um, yeah. Would you stick with Ten Hag for another year? Or would you go for the Zerbi? I'm going to stick with him for another year on on on, on so many different fronts. But firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm he, next year is going to be the best year. Next year, whatever that means in everyone's mind, next year will be the best year under Ten Hag. I promise you that. But the, 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 the bulk of the reasons as to why I would say that you have to keep him on is because, for me, Ten Hag is here for anywhere from seven to ten years if he creates his dynasty and his process properly. He's here from seven to ten years. Ineos are going to be here for easily 50 years, you know. You know, so 50 they, years easily, easily. You think they're gonna know? be here for 50 years? Easily, it's like a it's it's a basically this so Jim has come and purchased legacy. He wants you know, and that's that's longer than 20 years then, and I'm saying 50. But you know, he's he's come here to really make a stamp on 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 legacy here. So that's gonna be a longer period than a manager. So he this he has a he has a quite a unique opportunity in my mind to or not a unique opportunity for me as a fan, he has to show us that he can actually put in a structure properly under the under the under the current circumstances you know he has to really gut out the football club and change and 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 change the 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 the, the poor decision making that's been happening for about 10 or so years 12 or so years you know and and with that kind of thinking i think if you keep ten hag in you know you see what you can do in terms of maybe adding to the current squad now adding to the structure, getting people that can actually purchase proper footballers, a Premier League proven quality footballers within the club. I think, you know, he he's just got an opportunity here to, to and, and Ten Hag's been working with the squad as well. You know, imagine if you get the Zerbian now, he wants to reevaluate all the footballers again. And that and for us as fans, we already know certain footballers are just not. Do you think you would want to reevaluate players given the fact that he's been exposed to them in the Premier League for the last two years? Um, that's that's a good point. If it's the Zerbi specifically, um, that that is a, that is an understood point. But Ten Hag done the same thing. You know, we when 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 Ten Hag first came into the job, Minna, we were saying that was the worst squad and the worst finish. This is a rebuild. This will take time, more than two seasons for sure. Anyway, so with the, we, we, we it's like everyone's forgotten that, you know, and 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 with that, it's like we're going to be setting the new manager in with the exact same conditions or very similar if you get rid of him. In the summer, if you get rid of Tanag in the summer, the new manager won't have a structure. The structure Dan Ashworth and Jason Co and Will Cox, I think, from Southampton, is, yeah. is 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 are both coming in in January. You know, the f next season. You know, and really boots on ground. Yes, they could be doing backhand deals or talking and still communicating with the club, but it's real proper boots on the ground from January. So you know, we won't be going in this summer with a structure. It will be Omar Barada, you know, and and Co. You know, scouting team Ten Hag. Or, or the new manager. And that almost falls into the same situation that, that Ten Hag had when he first came into the club. So I just think, given give Ten Hag this one more window, let Ten Hag get rid of the players that he knows are not good enough. The, the Zerbi and Ten Hag want to both play front foot style of football. So, you know, the type of players that are not good enough or surplus to requirements, with it, especially that, the outgoings, that for me is proper backing. The outgoings, it's really, really quintessential. It frees up positions for other foot. For well, you know, the ones. outgoings this year, like unfortunately, guys, I don't want to burst the bubble of everyone about you know, outgoings. The outgoings this year are going to be the dead food, it's the things that we call dead food. It's going to be the I don't want to say, but palestries, the you know, the, the players on loan right now that are not doing well, that are not increasing their sell value. These are the players that are getting sold in the summer. They're not getting rid of Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford. I'm sorry to burst everybody's bubbles, yeah? But the players that will be sold are the players such as Alvaro Fernandes, Pelestri, uh, Van, de Don Van Beek, who's been rotting away on Frankfurt's uh, bench. You know, Hannibal Medjbury hasn't sniffed any time with Sevilla. The players that have gone out on loan, that have not done well, those are the players that will be sold. Then on top of that, the players that will be uh, leaving on a free, the Brandon Williams, the the the, the Martials, the, the Heatons. These are, when we hear in, like I've seen it quite often in reports, United are going to offload at least 10 players. These are the 10 players they're talking about. They're not talking mm -hmm. about, they are not talking about the Bruno Fernandes. They're not talking about Scott McTominay. They're not talking about Marcus Rashford. I think in the current start in 11, I would say maybe one player would get sold. Maybe one. But I do not see Man United selling Scott McTominay. I see them maybe selling Harry Maguire. Maybe. 
I don't see them selling Scott McTominay. I don't see them selling Marcus Rashford. I don't see them selling Bruno Fernandes. I don't see a big number of outgoings in the summer for large valuations. I think maybe the biggest sell in the summer might be Jadon Sancho. And that's a maybe if Borussia Dortmund pay more than 30 million for him. Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I understand that. And I think I think right now it, that, that makes sense. Um, it's it's more important to free the squad up. You know, you name seven players there plus Sancho eight. You know, you might get a Wamba Saka or Delo situation. Um, but yeah, there, there, there seems to be. And and but you really need to. I would say you really need to get rid of Maguire. But he's had a good season. But if you get rid of those seven, you know, and you and amass a certain amount of money, we need we need the next billion pounds. You know, because we over the last ten years, it's been however much it's been. Let's just say a billion. It's been poorly spent. You know, we're hoping that we just we really need to get rid of these players that you just listed. That but Donny Donny Van der Beek was meant to go on to be a top top footballer. You know, he was never happened. going to be a top top footballer. But guys, let's come on. Let's not do this revisionism of Donny Van der Beek. Donny Van der Beek was a good player in a good system. Yeah, Donny yeah, Van der Beek was a good player in a good system. There's a reason why in the Ajax team he was one of the last ones to leave of that 2019 Champions League team. Ziyech left before him. Delit. De Jong, all of them man left before him because people actually wanted it, wanted them. You look well, at Ziyech, now he's playing in, in, in Saudi, you know, the lit mm. is now, you know, re I would say restarting his career at Bayern, you know, mm. De Jong is at uh, Barcelona, etc. But Donny van mm. der Beek was a good player. This is, this is the thing is like, in, in transfer windows, would you rather get players that are good in a system or would you rather get players that you can mould into your system? Because I think Donny van der Beek was a player at Ajax who was in a good system at the time. And he just struggled with the intensity and the levels of Premier League football. I mean, he's gone on loan to Everton. Was it Everton he went on loan Everton. to? Yeah, he didn't to sniff playing time in a yeah, team yeah. that was fighting so, relegation. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is he was meant to be a good player from when the work that he done at Ajax. I think Real Madrid were looking for him as well at one stage in the 10th position. And he was meant to go on to, when, when he saw Ajax and, and van, Donny van der Beek, he thought, okay, this player could go on to be a top player. You know, but you know, we in terms of, you know, one of those other players in the squad, one of those seven that you name, you know, that shouldn't be in there because he should be a top player by now is what I'm trying to say. So you need to get, you need to free up the squad numbers so that you can get one of those players that are meant to be a top player again. You know, we're hanging on to too many footballers and, and Maguire for me is in that list. Um, Why is Maguire well, catching a stray though in, in that list with... You know, people that have done poorly on loan spells. Harry Maguire, guys, I get it. United players, you know, the United fans are not fond of him, but I think we need to give him the respect that he deserves based on this season, you know, because he's a player that's been probably one of our best defenders this season. In a season that's been injury ridden, you know, mm. in an ideal world, he probably wouldn't have played because, you know, people would have been fit. But one thing I always say is that, you know, when you have a squad of 23, 24, 25 players, when you're called upon, I just want you to perform. I don't care if I like you or not. That's why I celebrate Scott McTominay goals. I just yeah, want you to perform and I want you to do well. So we need to kind of let this idea or this notion pass that Harry Maguire is not capable of playing in other teams because I think he can. I think yeah. he's, you know, United could get money for him. And based on this season, they should rightly so. Yeah, yeah. 100% agree with everything you said there. I mean, I'm looking at, what the what the player's attributes are and what the what the system needs, he doesn't fit that. Last season we were showed that the structure let down the manager, you know. And and a lot of these situations where we're talking about outgoings, the structures let down the manager. We didn't start the season with a recognised structure, uh, with a rec with a recognised uh, forward. The structures let down the manager, you know. That we've purchased a lot of players injured. That I like to put percentage on things. A bit of that is on the manager's fault, a percentage on the manager, but the percentage on the structure as well. You know, Amrabat purchased injured, Hoyland purchased injured. You know, a lot of these things are not fully directly on the manager. Um, but yeah, with Harry Maguire, he's been brilliant this season. With Scott McTominay, he's been brilliant this season in terms of what he's offered us in moments, you know, and, and, and maybe not brilliant. Okay this season, because look at the position we're in. But these players were meant to be sold. If, if, if the structure was really working properly, they were meant to be sold. And it's so arrogant for us to think that we were going to amass a huge amount of money for these players when they were poor, purchased to go on to great things and have been inadequate with, throughout their time here. So we, had to, we have to cut our losses. We have to be honest with ourselves. 
You know, Mourinho's told us football heritage. We are only really a fifth or sixth place team for the last 10 years. That's what basically Mourinho was saying there. Ole's, Ole's cried because he couldn't take us to the next step. He said that on the Sky interview. And, 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 the, and Ralph has told us that it requires about 10 players to be gone and to freshen up the quality of the squad, get proper footballers for a proper manager like Ten Hag is to to be able to to be able to outlay his model, his game model. All managers, especially the ones that are innovative, Klopp and Pep, majority have come into the league with a completely new, mad kind of style of football. But their structures have enabled them to find humans on the planet because there will be humans on the planet can that can do what Ten Hag wants them to do. You know, they've been able to find humans on the planet for both Pep and Klopp that can enact what he wants them to enact. It's very simple. Give the manager time and then he's able to put those pieces together. Ten Hag has inherited so much overspending on players' wages, so much just headache, in my opinion, and, and hasn't been given the proper time to convert that into something else. Do you think with Ten Hag, you know, in the last week, he's come out after games quite optimistic, quite positive, complete opposite of like, because on the weekend, I don't know if you saw, but Poch kind of threw his players under the bus saying maybe these players are not experienced or good enough to basically play every three days. Whereas Ten Hag has been a bit of the opposite where he's been he's been buzzing, he's been happy, he's been, you know, kind of proud about the performances that we put in against Liverpool, against um, Brentford. You know, he was disappointed with Brentford um, and Chelsea also disappointed but after the Liverpool game Roy Keane said something after the game which made me laugh he was basically like maybe the, he's had a few to drink before he, he's done his interviews because he was like why is this guy so positive uh after this game where he the manager felt like we really went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Liverpool they they wasted some chances but United took control of the game in some aspects and created chances and uh, you know created overloads and did you ever actually feel like that in particular with the Liverpool game that United were the better team because I'm not gonna lie, bro. After 15 minutes, I don't think United were the better team. Um, so Ten Hag does this thing where you know, throughout the whole season, and, and I, I can't remember which game is that he, that it was, but he changed it. I don't know if it was the Brentford or Chelsea one, but he will give us the period of game or the period of minutes because in every single football match, Mina, you're going to suffer whether you're the best team in the world or the worst team in the world. You're going to suffer. And what I mean by that is there's going to be a period where the game is majority the other person's game. That's just how football is. You can never, ever, ever control a whole game and be in the opposition's half for the whole 90 minutes. I've seen City do it. No, it's impossible. I've they, seen they, City do it. I've seen, I've seen City sit in an opponent's half for 85 minutes of the game. But, but for the other five minutes, it was the other person's but game. That's then, bro, for five minutes is nothing. I've seen them do it for 90 minutes. I've seen them. I've seen them dominate teams comfortably, you know, and do it easily. Of course, they're a lot further ahead, but I think it's kind of absurd to say that teams don't do that because it, it happens. So, so it, 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 I can, I, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on this because the point I'm trying to make is it, what Ten Hag is doing there when he's speaking in the press is saying, look, in this 15 in 15 minute increment here, or for this X amount of minutes here. We played, whether it was in the counter-attacking phase, the transitional phase, or in the attacking phase, we were doing what I want them to do. And then, you know, and, and for me, that was the first 20 minutes of the game against Liverpool, even though they had most shots. Everyone's telling me about the most shots, and the, but I think we had most possession in those 15 minutes, or the, well, 20 minutes. For me, it's 20 minutes. But, you know, in that we had the most possession in that 20-minute increment period, the first 20 minutes. We had the most possession of the football, but they had the most looks on goal and shots on goal. Um, but Ten Hag, that's what he usually does. Um, so for me, up until, until those first 20 minutes, it was a Man, Uni Man United were imposing their style of football on the game a bit more. Whether it was from the counter-attacking phase or whatever it was, we were just imposing ourselves more. From the 20 minutes up to the 66th minute, which I think is when we scored our first goal from Bruno, I think, or was it from Kobe? That's when Bruno I think it was from Bruno. Player. Yeah, it was Bruno. Then it was Liverpool's game. Hands up, no problem. We were counter-attacking. We were, we were boxed in. They didn't create much opportunities. And Ten Hag saying that penultimately, he doesn't matter. He doesn't, as rest defence is extremely important to him and recovery runs is extremely important to him. But he, he cares most about the box defending in, in terms of how we defend. He wants to make sure that it's box defending is very, very good. And and, and to a degree, in it, for those 40 minutes up until the 66, it was okay. You know, we didn't, su we didn't suffer any goals or clear-cut 
chance. Well, we did a few, but th that's what I'm trying to say. From the first 20 to 40, uh, from, from 20 to 40 minutes, Liverpool's game. We score a goal when it kind of fizzles out a little bit. And, and then it was kind of a murky end-to-end -end kind of style up until we get our next goal. And that's when we get our next goal because we started creating more critical chances from a counter-attacking standpoint anyway. Our best standpoint, which is what I was saying a lot of the time against these kind of teams, the avenue for us to win these games is from the counter-attacks. That's what I was saying. Lo and behold, it is kind of a you know build-up, Casemiro bicycle kick into Kobe. Kobe does the magic. Uh, but you know and then towards the end of the game by the way the stats that i was reading was liverpool the best team after 70 minutes they're the ones that scored the most goals after 70 once you get to the 70th minute they're the team in the whole league by an astronomical number they scored they they put the ball in the net and running around that time uh, in and around that team liverpool i think there was something else as well from losing positions there was another stat that i saw come up during that game liverpool have the highest you know, amount, amount of points as, as ascertained from losing positions. So it was going to be a difficult game under those circumstances. I also think Ten Hag understands where the club is at whole or the squad, the 25 man squad. He understands our whole that this is not a first, this is not first place, second place, third place footballers. They're not, they're not, they're really not. You know, Mourinho said one of his best achievements was second place. Ten Hag, we all said last season to a degree, it was an overachievement with what he had. So we're going to, at some stage, you're going to balance that out into, you know, for, for these kind of performances against the opposition. So well, you also said that you would take, you also said, just to be a devil's advocate, you said you would take Ten Hag's first season over Mourinho's first season when Mourinho won more silverware. So yep. you're, you're saying that you're saying that Ten Hag overachieved last year, but you're also saying that that was a better season than um, Jose's first season. Yeah, reason why, reason point why, a personal preference is, is the reason point as to why, but it's the it's the style of football that he's trying to, to, to play. I like the triangles. I like the front foot style. I like the way that, for me, that's that, that's just how I like football and I enjoy football. So, you know, even though it wasn't that much different from Mourinho's football, um, you know, because Mourinho's football is a strictly counter-attack, 100 players behind the ball, you know, whereas that first Bro, you season... you can't be serious. You can't say, I like the triangles. You, yeah. That cannot be your reasoning as to one of the reasons why you would have take why you take Ten Hag's first season over Mourinho won two trophies, three if you count. I think uh, community shield. He won three. He, he won two trophies, Carabao and Europa League. Focused on Europa League to get to Champions League. Um, went on the next season, I think, to finish. I think it was second after that. You can't mm -hmm. say, oh, I prefer yeah. Ten Hag finishing third with one trophy over mm -hmm. two trophies and Champions League finish because. I like the triangles. This ain't maths what? class, bro. Yeah, I hear you. What position did Mourinho finish in that first season? I, I think he finished like fifth or sixth. But and, he finished in Champions League. And so did Ten Hag. He won Hag. Europa League. He finished in the Champions League. So did Ten Hag, Mina. So they both finished in Champions League, but one... But he won two trophies. Ten Hag won one. Yeah, that's not that much of a big difference for me in my mind. And so so you, you get to a position there where one manager, especially with the conditions that, that Ten Hag has had, that's that... The, that season under Ole, we were all saying that's the worst finish and the worst squad. It was it was one of the worst. It was one of the worst squads, and a rebuild was needed. So when you put that together, you get a third place finish and a trophy in, and Champions League qualification, which I forgot to add. And then you get Champions League qualification, four, fifth, or sixth, whatever Mourinho had, and two trophies. But then look at the style of footballs that both managers are playing. Mourinho was playing dinosaur football for me personally. Ten Hag is trying to play in the opposition's half, even though we kind of had to revert back to it and, and use a bit of Ole's principles. There's some really good goals against Arsenal build up from the back. The, the Maybe not the triangles then, I'll say the patterns of play. It was really good to see in comparison. So for me, it's always going to be Ten Hag's first season over Mourinho's one. And I think Mourinho had more world-class players. Mourinho had more world-class players in his team than, 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 than Ten Hag has right now. Don't make, don't make us compare the teams, bro. Yeah, don't I, I don't... Look. Don't make me pull up the teams. Don't make me pull up the teams because who was, <laughs> was world class in that Manchester United team? That just, nah, now I'm gonna have to go pull up the team. Now I'm gonna have to pull up the team. I'm gonna because you're making me do it. Who was world class in that um, Europa League team, bro? We had Ibrahimovic on his last legs. Probably Paul Pogba, I would say, was probably the most. It was, it was Lukaku there. It was Lukaku there? Huh? Was Lukaku there in Mourinho? No, so this is this is who we started in the in the Europa League final against against Ajax. It wasn't Eric Ten Hag who was the manager at the time, but it, it was Ajax that we played against. We had Romero in goal. We had a backline of Valencia, Smalling, Daily Blint, and Darmian. 
We had Herrera as a six, Pogba, Fellaini, Mata, right wing, Mkhitaryan, left wing, Rashford up top. That is who started uh, the Europa League final. Of course, there was injuries. So Eric Bailly was out. Ibrahimovic was out as well with an injury. But on the bench, we had Wayne Rooney, who was at the end of his career. We had Anthony Martial, Lingard, Carrick, end of his career. And Fosu Mensa and David De Gea and, and Phil Jones on the bench. You cannot tell me that that season... Uh, Jose Mourinho had more quotation marks world class players. I don't like the term, by the way, world class. Yeah. So maybe yeah, we can know, compare yeah. the players like for like. Yeah, yeah. Eric Ten Hag had the better players. He had the better back. Like, he had he had a Lissandro Martinez that he's he spent money on. He had David De Gea, who I will say was a good goalkeeper last year. I know I know you won't agree, but he was yeah, a good yeah. goalkeeper last year. He had players that he spent money on. You know. Jose Mourinho didn't spend big bucks on on some of these players. Can I just say that he, he didn't spend a lot? Like he didn't put his heart on the line for for some of them um, to, to get them signed. You know, we last year who else did we have? Bruno Fernandez, of course, um, yeah. Marcus Rashford as well. I think Marcus Rashford is the only player that's still part of that team. Yeah, Marcus Rashford is the only one that's still part of the team right now. But it's Jose yeah. that he actually said that he had he had he had more more class players. Um, I think I think someone in the chat just said it. Uh, Zlatan, Pogba, Rashford, Martial were still flying. David De Gea, Luke Shaw, Mourinho had more to work with than Eric Ten Hag has now. I don't... I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. I feel like also, I get the football, like the style of football. I get that argument. I get that argument 100%. You know, the yeah. Jose Mourinho was, was playing fossil football in comparison. Yeah what Eric Ten Hag was playing. But I also think it's an overstatement to say that Eric Ten Hag was playing good football um, for the entire time. Like, I think it's actually an, an overstatement to say that he was the whole of last season because, let's be real, bro, since United got knocked out of Europa, everything, since Barcelona last year, everything just went downhill. I yeah, think all the performances yeah. just, bam, went downhill. So it's quite deceptive to say that Eric Ten Hag was playing good football the entire last season. He wasn't. He wasn't. I, I can admit that he he wasn't. Um, he he's he's tried to he tried to play. So he tried to play his own style of football. Uh, you know, heavy with the build up, but he, he couldn't do that. Um, uh, he 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 was playing Ole Bolt in terms of the shape, but he wanted to move the lines a little bit higher. And 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 with with, with the quality of players that he had available to him, you're not going to be able to do that consistently. Um, but he managed to get a good enough level out of them to to ascertain the position that he did. Um. I think that he's he's he, he had a really good season, but it was an overachievement. Um, that compa in comparison to Mourinho's season and 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 throughout the and if we look at Mourinho's whole squad throughout the season, I think he would have had better just a better selection of footballers there, you know, especially in in their careers, their their abilities, what what they have or haven't achieved. Um, you know, they, they would have had better players there, in my opinion. But I think Ten Hag now deserves that extra season just just because of how this season's panned out and the work that he done in that first season. I, I, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always in two ways about Eric Ten Hag because sometimes I feel like he, I say this to you all the time. He doesn't help himself with what yeah. he does. Do you think he should go then? What do you think, Manav? Do you think he should go this season? And and maybe not the Zerbi because I, I've seen other managers. The Sporting Lisbon, the Sporting Lisbon. He's going. He's uh, Ruben Amaram is going Liverpool. He's probably going. Is to it? Liverpool. Yeah, he's probably. Going he looks to good. Liverpool. He looks like a really good coach. But I'm just obs I'm obsessed with. I'm, I want Ten Hag, but I'm obsessed with if it's not Ten Hag, the Zerbi, and I'll stick with that all the way. But do you, do you think he should go then? Do you, are you happy to see Ten Hag go? Or not happy? Do you think he just should be gone this season? You know what? I don't. I wouldn't say I. You know, he needs to get sacked. I want him gone. But I don't. His stubbornness makes it difficult for me to believe that him and Ineos's idea can coexist at the same time. That's the that's the difficult part for me. I think he's he's been clear, obviously, that you know he, how much involvement he wants in the team, um, you know how much involvement he wants in the structure, i.e., the recruitment, um, you know how much involvement he wants with the academy aspects in terms of the academy to first team pipeline. And I think maybe he did that because he knew he was coming into a team that didn't have that sort of structure. Now, I always said before I would like to see Eric Ten Hag in in structure in structure, you know, with a with a football director, with a sporting manager, with, with a sporting director, sorry, with, with a CEO, where his job is just to coach. Because mm. I think he's a good coach. I don't think he should be the title of a manager is what, you know, I don't think there's many managers, you know. Because managers are like yeah. Sir Alex Ferguson. They run everything. They manage yeah. everything to do with the club. That is what a manager is. I don't think he, I don't think Eric Ten Hag is a manager. I think he's a good coach. 
But is his coaching philosophy and his style suited for the Premier League? I don't think so. Because, you know, if I look at someone like Pep, for example, Pep came from Barcelona to Bayern Munich to Manchester City, three big clubs. Yeah, even though City, when he joined, wasn't really a big club. But three clubs with, you know, a stern idea of how he's going to play and how he's going to implement it and the players that he needs and what he needs in place. He didn't have to adapt because the club around him adapted to what he needed in terms of Manchester City. The club adapted and changed and altered and changed their football in direction based on what Pep needs and, you know, the, the, the utilisation of the ingredients he would need. Eric Ten Hag is not going to get that. Eric Ten Hag is being told that he or whoever is managing the team has to do what the CEO and the sporting director want. I don't know if Eric Ten Hag is going to do that. I'm not saying I know him personally, but from the 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 the, the way that I've seen him approach press conferences and the way he approaches games, and he's very much like a one size fits all kind of person, where he's got his one idea and his one plan. And that's the plan that's going to work. And if it's not going to work, then he's not going to change it. He's just going to persist with it. I don't. Do you think Eric Ten Hag will be happy to kind of take a back seat and be told, you know, if if hypothetically speaking, Ahmed Barada came today and said you have to play low block football and hit teams on the counter attack? Do you think Eric Ten Hag will be like, I'll do that? I don't think he would because I don't think that suits the way that he wants to play, and also the way he wants to play doesn't suit the Premier League because, I'm sorry, there is no way in delu- like there's enough delusion in the world, yeah, for Eric Ten Hag to realise that one six is not going to work. It could be the most mobile six. You can put Casemiro in his prime there and I think he'll still struggle. And you see it with City, for example. Rodri does not play as a lone six. He does not play as the deepest midfielder. Sometimes it's Kovacic that is sitting with Ruben Diaz. Kovacic is sitting sometimes and Rodri is just ahead. And you will have someone like John Stones when when he wasn't injured playing ahead of Rodri. So Rodri has that mobility behind him and he has the mobility in front of him. Casemiro doesn't have that. If it's Kobe Mano next season, Kobe Mano will not have the mobility in terms of Bruno Fernandes ahead of him, uh, Mason Mount maybe ahead of him and and Lissandro Martinez, who's injury prone. Let's be real. Mm-hmm. Lissandro Martinez is now going to be an injury prone player. So I think the way that Ineos are looking at everything, they've replaced the CEO. They've replaced, you know, they're bringing in a, a, a head of recruitment. They've gotten rid of, you know, Murto and Arnold. If they are completely stripping down from top to bottom, then I think it's only right that the manager is a new manager as well. Don't you think so? That it's a manager that they pick? Because next year, if Eric Ten Hag did stay, and this is a question to you and everyone else, if Eric Ten Hag did stay as coach next year or as manager next year and it doesn't work out, Ineos will be like, oh, you know, we gave him a chance, but he was not our plan. He wasn't our plan. Don't you think that that's the case? Yes, yes, I agree. That's perfect though, Mena. Like I said, it's an insurance policy for Ineos. They, 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 they need to make sure that what they're trying to implement, the infrastructure for the next 50 years, is correct. And with Tenag here, you, you're kind of... So, so by the way, I think he will be absolutely so happy, grateful, gracious, wonderful. Oh, he's going to be absolutely smiling when somebody tells him what to do. Oh, <laughs> believe me. Oh, Mina, he's going to be so happy. No, he ain't, bro. Oh. He's not. He wants... He, he, He's not a yes man. He's Eric oh, Ten Hag is not a yes man. Dutch Dutch coaches are not yes men, guys. They are so not yes men. It's not that they're yes men. He is a, a corrupt. He's in cooperation. So he, he he said this before already that there's impresses that there's a lot to do currently as just the manager. He will be more than welcome to give off the responsibilities, and he's more than capable and qualified to work in tandem. And and I think that's something that he's welcoming. He, he's welcoming this. He wants the more expertise in and around his him. So I'm really, really hoping that he's in a position where, you know, they do come and they do add the, what, what's necessary, which they will do, I believe. So they, they need to give him, from an India standpoint, they need to give him another, they need to give him another season to see his work and, and, and to see what he's about. But for me, it's it's a thing where if they get their new manager in and it doesn't work for the first season, then we, we might be in a very negative spiral of the exact same thing you know where we're saying oh you know this manager needs to go it needs time and 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 Ineos need to really embed their structure and and see how it's operating above the manager it needs time to see that how that's going to progress in my opinion 
I think Ten Hag, like I said, I think is someone that can work under a structure. I think is someone that will prosper under a structure. And whether he's told to do ultra counter attack, I think he will find avenues with his total football, positional rotation, high intensity running style of football. I think he will be able to get you know a level out of the players or or, or a system out of the players. He has a wonderful counter attack. You know, I, I I was I've said it to you before that I, to a degree I think it's better than Ole's. You know, but it's, which sounds ludicrous, but. I, I re- I've seen it against, especially the top teams, but Ole was really good against the top teams. But it's just really, he's got a good counter-attacking system for a man that is possession is possession heavy. So I, I think, you know, we, we need to give, we re- it would be a massive, massive mistake getting rid of Ten Hag at the end of this season, I think, you know, and, and, and even if he's not the one, he would have been able to get rid of, he would have been able to back him and get rid of extract X amount of footballers out of the club. And then hopefully, you know, Ineos, with the help of Ineos, would have been able to purchase players that footballing people above Ten Hag have also agreed. Because you know, Ole said in that in in that in that round table thing that they, the overlap that you know it's a veto system. It's the scouts, Te- Ole, and the Glazers that all have to agree in tandem for a signing to be met. And you know, I don't know how the scouting network has been operating, but if we just look at the previous season's work, it hasn't been brilliant. With with you know, Ole, they, you know. They, the, the the structure never really ever backs managers in getting their first signings. You know, it was only this time, and lo and behold, we made a mistake on it. But it was it was this time now where that opportunity has arrived on a, on a manager's doorstep. And usually, it's you know the Glazers, and and even to a degree, you can. You, I have almost the feeling that that still was in place. Casemiro, I don't think was fully a Ten Hag signing. You know, uh, Mason Mount is maybe a marketable PR, and I'm not saying it's a bad signing. I think Mason Mount is going to go on to do fantastic things for this football club. And him and Hoyland as a 9 and 10, I think is a very, very scary combination in terms of how you want to press and impose yourself in the forward line. That's an elite combination. Them two are very hardworking, but they're just young and they need to mature a little bit more. But um, I just think we need to give this manager time. And and we'll be in a, we're, we're extremely, extremely, you know, uh, potent to making the exact same mistake again. So let me ask you a question because Riri actually brought it up in the in the chat in terms of if if Ten Hag was to leave, who would you want? Don't you see similarities in the Zerbi and and Ten Hag? Do you, do you yeah. see similarities? And if so, don't you think then that's a bad idea for the Zerbi to be an option if it's not working with Ten Hag? If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I do because you know it's you know Ten Hag's been fail well, for for everyone in the world. They, I don't think he's been failing. I think he's been managing or or trying to yeah, literally managing the situation and and so you still don't trying think he's, to. He's, he's failed this season. When you put everything together, that is it's just yes single, or no, bro. Do you think no, he failed? Does it, no, has failed this I, I, I don't like to give yes or no's. I think though it's so complex the game, but no, essentially, and no, but. Um, the reason why the difference between Ten Hag and De Zerbi is one is playing positional rotations and offers trust and is trying to get and is a bit closer to the total football, whereas De Zerbi is extremely systematic. It's extremely systematic. Like I'm talking extremely. Is Ten Hag systematic. not systematic as well? This is the same guy that needs certain players to play in a certain every, way. Every single football, every single. But is that not then? Are you not saying then? Then Ten Hag is systematic too. If if De Zerbi is systematic, then so is Ten Hag. So, so what I mean by that, and maybe I'll use a different word, is is, is football automation in terms of the, it's going to be the exact same plays every single time. Whereas Ten Hag wants a player to rotate into the left back or to the right back. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see the winger switch over. You know, he doesn't mind where players are all, at all times. Whereas the Zerbi wants the players to be standing in that position, 15 centimetres, you know, to the left, to the right, exactly where they're exactly. And then the and then the drill he's drilling the exact same passing build up system ex- like ten thousand times. Whereas Tenog is trusting you to okay in this moment of the game you can be here if you want to move a bit a bit further forward move further forward move further back like he's given you a bit more you know trust in terms of how you operate within what he wants you to do. Whereas for me I think the is extremely more strict. I think you know when you have less quality players you have to be very very strict on and on on your rules and exactly how you want them to play but at the top level you know similar to like an Ancelotti and a, and a Zidane there's a lot more freedom of expression in terms of how the world class top top level specific players can operate because you know it their 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 ability exuberates you know 
uh, quality against their opponent. You know, Real Madrid, or they're all superstars. You know, once you get all superstars, and by the way, City, all superstars or all, you know, stoked in Premier Leagues and, and Champions League, you know, they're, they're very, very credible footballers. So, you know, we don't have that, you know. So you, you, that's, that's also why you're seeing the breakdown in terms of what Ten Hag wants you to do. Okay, so let me ask you a question then, because you said that systematically, you know, you said that the Zerbi has a very rigid system where it's, you know, players in specific positions at certain times at all times. So then why do you want the Zerbi? Like if, I say, if, if you're compared, because right now when you just compared the Zerbi and Ten Hag, it's like they're opposites. So then why would you want the Zerbi if Ten Hag leaves, if he's a very rigid and systematic manager? Because because the 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 the, the store like the, the the rate of progression under the Zerbi will be so they I, I think Ten Hag will ask I, well, let's let's I'm gonna explain it through Ten Guys, Hag. we got him, we got him, he no, can't no, answer it. Yeah, no, we got him, we got him. <laughs> No, no, no. Let me finish. You can't answer so, it, bro. You're no, stuttering no, like Stormzy. You're stuttering like Stormzy right now. You yeah, can't answer it. <laughs> no, no, no. It's because it's hard to explain, man. So basically, it's it's like under Ten Hag, it's like we will get to a place where there's total football. The footballers can they'll appear up in different kind of positions, and and it's just more beautiful football aesthetically because football, they're they're appearing in where they feel. Whereas under the Zerbi, it's it's no matter what footballer it is. They will be, and then it's a matter of your ability. So your rate of progression in that way, for me, is more predictable than, for want of a better word, because it's literally you can see it every single time. What is he doing there? The last twenty games, he's meant to be there. Whereas under Ten Hag, he lets you move into different positions. So you want a better footballer that's more confident, more quality. You you, you need that that natural ability, that natural um, kind of flavor from a player to come out a bit more. Is what Ten Hag's trying to bring out of players. Whereas the Zerbi, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter what it is. The instruction is the instruction. Tenog is trusting players to, 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 to have the temperament and the right kind of control of thought and mind to be in the right positions. And, and he's blaming their, their mentality, which, which Ole's also mentioned, as to why they're not able to take this next step. Um, th th this will benefit us. Having a Zerbi will benefit us in this stage of the process. You know, but when you're trying said to... He's systematic and he's rigid and... And you pointed out the flaws in his system and why Ten Hag's system is better than the, the, in the long the run. So then why are you now saying that we would actually benefit from the Zerbi system? Is that saying that the Zerbi system is better for United than Ten Hag is? Then why would you want Ten Hag to stay another year? Because, again, I'm in the long run. So in the, I'm trying to create the dynasty. So the seven years, in the long run, you end up with world-class players similar to, to Real Madrid. Whereas under the Zerbi, in the long run, you end up with similar players closer to Barcelona, where it's the exact same style of football every single time. Whereas Real Madrid, they can play any formation. Everyone's world class. Do what you have to do. You know, Ancelotti run it. You know, with Ten Hag, it's, you know, he, he's, he hasn't got the right quality of players right now, Mina. So it's like, but he's still trying to tell them, you know, these are the rules and instructions, but do what you have to do. Feel the moments. Under the Zerbi, it's literally the exact same play every single time. Right now, with this squad of players, they don't have the temperament and the control, the understanding to do it off field, if that makes sense. That you know, right now they need to get the whiplash out and said it's only this. And if you can't only do this, then go. But in the lot that that for me, aesthetically, and how the how it will look in the long run, you know, you will get I think Ten Hag is more beautiful football and and more just Brazilian samba kind of football closer to you. And, and maybe I'm explaining that wrong, but you get better football that way. Under the Zerbi, you're not going to... You can laugh, but under the Zerbi, you're going to get more football automation and systematic football because it's the exact same thing. And even though it's world-class players that will be doing it at the end, they, they there's less mistakes. It's, un, you know, under the in, under the demands of the Zerbi, in the, you know, under pressure in tight spaces, it's more systematic and quick. Whereas Ten Hag, you'll get players doing carrying the ball wonderfully and you know taking on three or four players wonderfully because he's a, he allows that kind of creative freedom. It's hard to explain. I'm, I'm I know exactly what I'm saying, but I, it's just I, and no I, one I just yeah I don't to me it just it doesn't make sense. I'm not gonna lie, it it, it doesn't make sense about play it back and you will understand what I'm saying. I'm gonna ha I might have to watch it back to try to try to understand because you said you talked about fo football automation. You talked about players having the feel. You talked about, you know, the Zerbi having an automated system. Um, you took, you, and, then, and then in that same breath, you said that Ten Hag is 
the better one for for, for mm -hmm. the job. But then you mm -hmm. said that also United in this current position might actually benefit of having De Zerbi rather than having Ten Hag. But then mm -hmm. you said that Ten Hag should stay for a year uh, because mm -hmm. he's building a well, dynasty. Well, well. But then you said if he leaves, then I'll take De Zerbi, even though you said that De Zerbi is more rigid. As a... So I don't get it. It's because it's contradicted. <laughs> no, Everything is no, contradicted no, because... itself. Well, I, well, if you if you just if you put the Zerbi and then Ten Hag and start listing everything that I said about the two, it makes it more clearer. But if but you know I've always so I always knew long before many people within the fan base who my next appointment would be. When did and you know if, it was the Zerbi that it should be the Zerbi after Ten Hag? So or or if because I because I still believe in f football expression, beautiful football, samba football. So I've always so for me it's more. You know, always have Ten Hag keep battling away at it and create, let him create a system within the Premier League, similar to what Klopp did, similar to what Pep did. So, you know, I've I've always believed in that. Give it the dynasty, give it the time to work and 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 upregulate the quality of footballer here. We've we've been told open heart surgery and our football heritage is rubbish footballers here right now. So wait, let the structure come in and upregulate the quality, and then you will see what Ten Hag's really trying to do. But with the Zerbi right now, we're in a process right now. And, and even if you get a new manager, we're in a process right now to get him back to first and first place and, and lifting trophies. But that's what we're in. We're in a process of that. For the last 10 years, we haven't been doing that. So we're in a process. Even the next manager. I, I was one of the last people to support Ole, believe it or not. Everyone was saying get Ole out. But the first 13 games, I was saying, guys, give him time. It's only 13 games into the season. Give him time. Let him keep working. Yes, it got worse and worse and worse. And, and the reason why I ended up getting rid of him is because I'm thinking, I don't even like this style of football anyway, this counter-attack, counter-attack. But you, you need to, and, and, and lo and behold, we find out on the overlap that he wanted better footballers and that he was trying to push the lines up higher. So we should have given Ole time. But you'll, you will be making the same mistake if we don't give Ten Hag time. So that's why I'm saying next season out of a gentleman's agreement for his contract. But I believe you Tenok should be here much longer than that. But if but if Ineos under structure, because you're the one that brought the reality to me, Mina, by the way, you was the you was one of the first people back in like December saying to me, listen, if they want to change this, this and this, then lo and behold, Marcel, best believe that it could be very possible that Ten Hag goes as well. And I accepted it then. But in like November, I was saying, listen, if that happens, because I'd all I'd foreseen it as well to a degree, if that does happen, there's a reality to be met. Bring me the Zerbi then, because there will be less of this freedom of expression, less free flowing samba. You know, he's telling players to step up, but they're not doing it because if they're in doubt, they drop back. Do you know what I mean? But with the Zerbi, it's no, you must go and run there and we will get smoked on the counter attack and look like an idiot. But this is what I, you must obsess on what I'm telling you to do. Do you get it? Where right now within the process, that's maybe what these footballers need until we can clearly see it and then we upregulate the quality with the structure. And we've got but we've the money. We've seen that with the team right now. We've seen them overcommitting in a press. We've seen them, you know, pressing man for man or, you know, pressing for spaces, trying to close the passing lanes, getting caught on counter attacks. We've seen them doing that. So it's not about whether they're capable of doing that or not, because we've seen under Eric Ten Hag that they're tactically following the manager's instructions, which is that. How, do you think it would be a not good idea team. for a manager like the Zerbi, who, you know, we've seen Brighton, by the way, get walloped? I've seen Brighton hold goals this season last season mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but in a he's I think the Zerbi is playing in a way with a less better team like I think when you man for man compare those squads Manchester United have the better team so is that not to say that the Zerbi could do a lot better with a better team than what he has at his expense right now I think I think the player profiles at Brighton are more suited to what both managers want to do so I think even if Ten Hag maybe controlled, if Ten Hag had control of Brighton, he could maybe operate in a similar way or better than 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 the Zerbi's currently doing. Because both currently, how they set out to play football, the Zerbi has the better a group of footballers to to carry that out. You know, the front foot style of football. We have the better group of footballers for the counter attacking style of football. Manchester United have always had those footballers. That's why counter attack so good. But it's just the, like I'm looking at the long term game and, and everyone laughed at me when I said it before on a full view. I'm, I've looked 10 years back and I'm looking 10 years in front. Where do you see you us know? in 10 years then? In 10 Because you also said to me that in because you're 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 full of praise today for Ineos. But bro, last stream you were saying to me that Ineos shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt because they still have a lot to prove to us. But yet you yes. have a lot of praise 
for Ineos and the structure and everything. 10 years yeah. from now, what are we in? 2024. So 2034, yeah? Where do you see Manchester United? Do you see them still under Eric Ten Hag? Do you see them under another manager or even another manager after? Because you say that you look 10 years ahead. Can you give us an idea of what your timeline looks like across that 10 years? So with, with, with Ten Hag, it's, it's a thing where we have to keep the manager in, firstly. You know, we're, we're looking at we're looking at references from Man City and Liverpool in terms of how that pans out over a seven, eight, nine, ten year period. And and for the first few years when they're trying to implement their style of football, they need structure to purchase these top footballers for them. They need structure to get rid of these footballers for them. And once it's embedded in after two or three seasons, you know, with both managers and they and the whole squad is theirs, they pick they start picking up trophies, man. You know, and and you know the players start to believe in their systems. I, I genuinely believe that we start picking up multiple Premier Leagues and Champions Leagues. You know, maybe three cha- over the course of ten years. If if we stick with Ten Hag, easily three Premier Leagues get picked up. Easily one or two Champions Leagues get picked up. The manager's already picking up cup trophies right now under the current premises and conditions. So more cup trophies to be picked up. I genuinely believe that. It's just. Some seasons, like this one, there's mitigating circumstances that hinder that process. But now he's going to get a structure added to him, which, by the way, at Ajax, it worked wonderfully well to a degree, you know, depending on how what your levels are and what your standards are, what people call, you know, is different. But Man United are stoked in heritage right now in terms of that youth team. We'll, we've always been able to dig into that academy and get world-class footballers out of them. We've got about three of oh, potentially world-class footballers out of them. Kobe, Ganacho. Hoyland's not part of the academy, but Kobe Ganacho, we've got um, Oyadeli, Shia Lacey, all of these footballers that look like, oh my days, you know, if these lot come through, Kambuala's there as well, you know, Ahmad is a young player, he's not through the academy, but we've got a lot, uh, Fitzgerald, another midfielder, is, is very good, I like Fitzgerald as well, you know, there's a lot of players there that, you know, as the time goes on, they're really going to be, oh, Amas, they're, they're really going to be able to add themselves into the squad and improve through the squad. So we've got the academy there that looks like it's cooking. Ten Hag has not has had a poor a, a talent ID. That's going to get taken out of his hands. And if it's the best in class in England, then best believe, I think re, some really good players should be coming through the door within the next 10 years. It's only, it, it's gearing up, especially with the way Sir, Sir Jim is doing it. And the reason why I said to you before is that, you know, they have to prove something to us. Part of that package is keeping Ten Hag for the next season. You know, so if, they, they, they if, if they keep Ten Hag, that's them proving to us. What are they proving to us by keeping Ten Hag? What What are they proving? Yeah, to us? They're proving to us that they're able to purchase quality footballers for a system. They're the one that's going to dig at the start of next season, and even in in the middle of this season, Mina. I think they have dictated to him, and by the way, the Glazers as well. They have dictated to him what the style of football would be. So, yes, you can't be no, high- no, no. You can't say that. You can't Go say on. that. You Go can't on. say that. You cannot. So you're saying right now the way United, are, you're saying right now the way that United are playing, has been dictated to the manager. That's correct. That's correct. And 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 if it's not just dictated, then it's agreed upon. It's agreed upon. It's a. It's it's not just a dictated to hundred percent Ten Hag, which I think it is. Uh, which hundred percent um, um, hundred percent Glazers and Ineos, because even now, because when Ineos wasn't here, he said it's hybrid football. When, when Ineos have come in now, he's still saying the same kind of things, extreme high block, extreme low block, transitional, best transitional team. If this wasn't the type of football that, you know, the Glazers, Ineos and Ten Hag wanted, I'm pretty sure he would have come out and said, OK, well, you know, Ineos have come in now, Omar Barada, the CEO is here, it's, te- it's counter-attack football. And from this very game, the next game against Bournemouth, we will be playing this. He's carried on in the same ilk of football. If they keep him on, Mina, he's going to carry on with the same ilk of football. This is, an, a, this is a holistic agreement between every single person working for the football club. And you can assume then that Ineos will be carrying on that style of football as well, beyond Ten Hag, if he gets sold or sold sacked. So for me, I think this is an agreed upon style of football. It just needs to be upregulated. Firstly, Omar Barada, the, guy, the poor guy's catching strays. He hasn't even come into his role. He legally has not, he's not starting until 1st of July. So I don't think he's had a say in the way that United are playing, number one. Number two, I don't think the Glazers give a, sh- give a I'm fasting, so I can't swear. I don't think the Glazers ca- care enough to dictate 
the way I mean they sold literally the entire sporting structure of Manchester United. They don't care about how United play football. I don't think any of us have even come in to say, I don't think they even know. I think they know actually the style of football they want to play, which is why I think yeah. they know the manager that they want in the summer. The way that Ten Hag has set United up over the last couple months, there has been clear patterns in it that this is the way that the manager wants to play. One game we played Liverpool, we went to Anfield, we played low block, we defended for our lives. The next game at Old Trafford, we played counter-attacking football because it was Old Trafford. We had the pace, we had the speed, you know, the crowd, you had the 12th man. You know, you you we've played against Luton 1-0. We lost to Fulham 2-1, Wolves 4-3. You're telling me that these are games. We lost to City 3-1 or however much it was. You're saying to me that this is instructions from Ineos and Umar Barada and the Glazers and, and Ten Hag is just doing that. That's what you're saying to me. No, on, no, 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 because I'm going to... No. Okay, well, yeah, so no, because I'm going to retract to a degree what I'm saying when you play it out like that. It's an agreed upon thing in tandem, because that's also what I was saying. So it's, it's yes, this is what my the manager wants to play, or, or what he said, his style of football, because he doesn't have the player profiles to do otherwise. But with Manchester United's DNA, I'm also going to add these hybrid elements to it. And once that's been outlaid, that's what I'm that's what he's going to continue to do and that's you know it's all agreed upon the system you know when Tanaga said to us because he said this in presses I don't know if this is maybe this is wrong what I'm about to say but he's also said that he has no doubt in his mind that you know that uh that he's going to be led on to next season so again they're still in you know correlation with what he's thinking and his thoughts or what his because he's still it, it hasn't I don't think Manchester United purchased him and 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 just said play possession in football I think they did have an element of conditions of how he should be playing or what he needs to involve in that style of football. You know, for, <clears throat> you know, Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford being part of those two players uh, or, or 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 signings. I, I mentioned, I remember mentioning this to you many weeks, ago, well, many shows ago. Like, was those Ten Hag's decisions, Bruno and Rashford? You know, those contracts they were already on the table. So you know, when you know Ten Hag at the Crystal Palace, the manager Palace gets game, a say in it. I think because I don't his... think the club will give a player an extension if the manager has no future for him. He gets a say, but imagine just like Crystal Palace was the was the game that he goes to and he sees. He's had many a talks with the with the players. This is the season before Ten Hag arrives. There's two players left on a contract. I think the the, the structure above Ten Hag says you need to you need to include these two footballers in everything that you do. They must do. They just must do. They're, they're running out of their contract. You're going to lose an astronomical amount of money if you can't sell them efficiently. They've told him and pointed a finger at Tenag and said, you must include these footballers in everything that you do. So with that, they're influencing his style of football. You know, with that, they're, they're, they're dictating to him and elements that he has to include with his style of football. So then he comes out and tells us it's hybrid football. So, you know, and, and it's not just that. You know, the whole squad, the rest of the squad, they're not going to do what Ajax are doing. That's just obvious. So then, we're, then now we get to this point. Fast forward all of that to this point right now. I'm hearing talks of not Tenog being sacked, not the the structure still backing him. So Jim not saying I'm gonna sack the manager. I'm doing I'm gonna sack everyone else but the manager so that I can help improve the manager. So if I see Tenog in office next season, they've they've bought in to this style of football. They are putting money in for what's happening currently and believe in it. So for me, we need to upregulate this. Then you know. Klopp had that exact same thing. He wanted rock and roll football. Then it hell bent for two seasons. Was playing rubbish for two seasons. But the the, the structure upregulated it for him. Pep was hell bent on his style of football. The structure was so good. Man City was so good. They didn't up They didn't hire within. This is what Man United have been doing at the beginning of the show. We kind of outlaid how you know Gill, all these people were bought within. Poor you know businessmen just you know getting this job that. City went and got the best in class for that particular manager and then, you know, upregulated his style of football, you know, with getting every single season 50 million, 50 million in January and a 50 million. At the end of the season, I give you five 50 million players, you know, every two million, every two minutes. Because, by the way, the best teams in the world is the chairman's money. Just go and watch Obi-Wan podcast with Mourinho. That's what Mourinho outlays, a GOAT manager. He says the best teams in the world, when you're looking at the best teams in the world, you're looking at the best players in the best position and you're looking at the chairman's money. 
So to a degree, we, we need investment. We need the best in class structure around us. And, and we need to give it time to be improved. These players are not good enough to do these kind of things that we're asking them to do. And you're seeing it play in your fate. Like, I hear it. I, hear it. I still disagree. Yeah, I disagree with what you said about, you know, the structure um, having some sort of say. Uh, big up to Kyle with the super chat. says, regardless of manager, we have players that have low IQ. They can't pass, defend the middle, press correctly together. You can't play Ajax ball. But that kind of takes me back to my point is, if you know you don't have the ingredients... Like I'm not gonna come into I'm not gonna walk into my kitchen, guys, and try and make a, a steak when I know I got chicken in the freezer, and I ain't got steak. Why would I try to do that? I ain't gonna go in and try and make you know a chocolate cheesecake. Um, but I've only got ingredients to make I don't know a date cake. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna work with the ingredients I have and make what I can out of those ingredients. So my point is is if these players cannot do certain things that the manager needs the player to do in order to play the way that the manager plays, then I think you take a step back from the situation and you play to your players' strengths until you get the players that you need, until you get the Frankie Dion's, until you get, I don't know, whoever it is that the manager wants in midfield, until you get that, you know, don't be pressing like, a, don't encourage your midfield to press like psychopaths. Don't impress them. Don't 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 require them to be pressing half of them man for man and half of them pressing for space. And as a result, you're leaving a lot of space unoccupied for the opponents to, to kind of dictate in. Don't do that stuff. Utilize what you have and wait until you get what you need and then play the way. Because I'm sure I'm I don't know. Maybe I'm in the minority and maybe I'm being a bit like I'm being a bit delusional. But if United were getting good results in good ways, but we're not playing Ten Hag style football. I would have been like, you know what? Okay, I understand that these players are not capable of doing that. So if he has to play counter-attacking football or something like that for a year until he gets the midfielder that he needs and the winger that he needs and this that he needs, I'll be like, okay, cool. But it's the fact that, you know, we've persistently been told or been suggested that, you know, the manager comes out and he does say indirectly these players can't do what I want them to do. He said it indirectly many times. So for me, it's like, if you've accepted that, and we as fans know that. Why cannot you? Why can't you alter your style of playing to capitalize on you know the, the the abilities of the players that you have at that time, and then come summer get the players that you need and keep it moving because you know you needed a. We went from Frankie De Jong to Casemiro to Mason Mount. Mathematically, that is one plus one plus one equals twenty five thousand million. It don't make sense. It's it's completely three different profiles. It doesn't make sense to me. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of what you just said described last season. So he he had a game model. So and 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 in terms of the fridge analogy and the steak, football's not steak and 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 cooking. So it's it's a little. No, it's but I'm so saying, cool. bro, I'm using it as an example. Yeah, like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm trying ingredients. to explain why it's not the example to use. So it it's is like, an example to use. It is. It's, can it's, I explain why it's not? It, it so, is an example. All right, explain why it's not an example. Yeah. So me, so. We have a we 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 are trying to create a style of football here. It like it's it's not, like he 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 went back to 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 Ole Ball last season when he tried to get players in a, a, a different style of football. He went back to Ole Ball. He's done that already. Even in this season, he's done what you just described, where he's had to retract because of the lack of footballers that can do what he wants to do. He's retracted this season, like I described, Burnley, Sheffield. Many a game where it's just looking like, what is this? This is this is not even the three one six. This is four two three one. Let's see what. Let's go and play football. You know, or with the with the passing patterns and movements in there. We've seen that this season. The the the, the decimation of the squad has not allowed him to to make the stake. You know, he's just had he's he's had an unseasoned stake this season because it's just you know he's tried to do it, but he doesn't have everything, so he can't really do it. Um. And and then what you wanted to go back for the second season to uh, reserve you know less of himself again, we need to go into the market and buy the ingredients. We need to go to Sainsbury's, Tesco's, and Morrison's and go and get these ingredients so that he can make his proper steak. You know, and that's the best way for me to put it to you in that sense. I think. I know talking about food is actually a bad anal analogy because I'm I'm fasting and I'm a bit hungry today. Uh, but big <laughs> up to everyone. Before we wrap it up, come uh, next five games. I think it's a run of games that United should, on paper, win quite comfortably. 
um, starting off next week or this week, sorry, Saturday, Bournemouth mm-hmm. away from home. That's going to be a difficult one just because of how United, I think, play away from home. Um, yeah. Then after that, new uh, is Coventry in the in the FA Cup, Sheffield, Burnley, Crystal Palace, and then we have Arsenal. Uh, that's towards May. The next four, four, let's say the next four Premier League games. Given the fact that United are currently one in six for Premier League wins. Do you expect, do you think United, not expect, do you think United will win those four games given that it's Bournemouth, it's Sheffield, it's Burnley and it's Palace? Palace is difficult away because I think that's uh, that's the away and I never away one. Uh, Bournemouth, I think, is away, like you said. Burnley, Burnley, I think, is at home. Burnley and Sheffield is at home. Wow, so those two Within a three-day period. All those get, those those two games. uh, We we have um, FA Cup weekend. And then a mid midweek game Premier League, and then a weekend Premier League game. So that's three games in eight days. Wow, I, I, I've Ten Hag is finds it is it the way the, the stubbornness of Ten Hag in terms of rotation is a never weakness of of. But that I guess could, you could count as in game management and prep. But it's also preparation, which is outside of the game. So that's another thing. You know, he's extremely stubborn to rotate players, but he's I'm seeing a little bit of it from time to time nowadays. So, but those on paper, like you said. But the decimation of squad, the lack of routines within the team, I, I, you know me, extremely optimistic in, in terms of how I view the team. So we sh- we need to we, we need to win those games. Every single game is a cup final, and when I look at that on paper, uh, the two home games for sure, Sheffield and Burnley, I'm saying six points. Um, Bournemouth, we got bullied, we got embarrassed um, at home, three 0 I think, all three mistakes. Um, from the in our half, you know, Scott McTominay, the combinations in there, the, the breakdown, you know, Solanke's that it was three poor goals conceded. Um, but I think Bournemouth last season, you know, Casemiro comes through and scores important goals for us, and, and, we, and we win the game just about to get us enough points to get into that Champions League. Um, I think the four games, three of them wins, and then Crystal Palace maybe a draw or loss away from home because it's a very tough place to go to. Yeah, I don't know, man. I, I, I say this all the time, I'm quite. I don't like to predict games because I just don't know. You don't know what you're getting with United this season. Every game, yeah. you don't know what sort. I remember I went Everton. I was gassed. I thought, yeah, Everton, you know, fighting relegation, not performing well. Sean Dyche ball, snooze fest. Snooze fest. And then the week later, Liverpool madness, FA Cup. Mm-hmm. So you never know what you're getting with United this season. But I think it'll be very interesting. For me, I'm in, I don't know how you feel. I'll be real. I'm ready to see the end of the season. Like 19th May couldn't come in quick enough for me. 19th of May, I'm counting down to the end of the Premier League season. Yeah, yeah, I, I can agree because I really want to see what happens in the summer. Um, but it's it's one of them ones. I, you know, it was from the from the from the Brentford game to you know Scott McTominay talking about out of body experience to crucial goals, and it was a write off season from then. You know, you know, you know that was that at that point it's at least 10, 11, 12 comp- defensive line combinations, and you're thinking where's the stability? How can you get the run? And then you know a lot of players purchased injured. I think it was a write off season then. Um, but I, I know next season under Eric Ten Hag will be a great season. That is that is a very yeah. That's a very. Fair, I don't want to say it's a hot take. I don't want to say that's blasphemous because that's your opinion. But that's a very optimistic thing to say. You know, Marcel. Is, Marcel is the king of optimism. Listen, I say this all the time, bro. If I was if I was arrested today. I would have you as my lawyer, not because I think you are convincing, but because I think the police would just let me go because they don't want to hear you talking anymore. They would just let me go. They'll be like, your lawyer <laughs> talks too much. He's, he's, say, he's, he's adamant that you didn't do it. So we're just going to believe him. Not because we believe him. We're just going to believe him for the sake of it. Yeah, you're free, same way. You're free, same way. There's more than one way to skin a cat. You know, you know what it is, man. Cat. Let them know where they can find you uh, if, if they want to find you online, everything. And let me know, what do you think Champions League today? Real Madrid versus... Um, um, City and Arsenal versus Bayern. I'm actually going to the Bayern Arsenal game. Ooh. So I'm going um, to hate, I hate on both teams. I'm hating on both of them. Yeah, I, I hope Bayern. Oh, you're seeing Musiala. Are you going to get to see Musiala play today? Oh, uh, Minna. Oh, wow. You Shout out to my family. Them. Shout out to PlayStation for. I love them, man. That's what Please. I'm saying. Shout out to, shout to, shout to them. Shout out them out big time because you got, you're going to see good footballers on the pitch and, and Musiala. Oof. So, yeah, hopefully Bayern win. You know, I don't want to see Arsenal win and advance in the Champions League. And then 
But Real Madrid City is gonna get are never gonna be another high quality game. You know, so many good footballers on the pitch. Jude Jude doing his thing. I hope I hope Real Madrid win. So I'm hating on the English teams right now. But you did say that we need them to get our fifth place qualification. So in the same breath, hopefully they they kind of fizzle out and do all right as well. Yeah, I think it would be an interesting game. Just a disclaimer, guys. I'm not an Arsenal fan. I actually yeah, no, go to football no. games all across the country and in Europe because I'm a football fan. Um, yeah. Simple as that. Like I've been to PSG games. No one said I was a PSG fan. I've been to Chelsea games. No one said I was a Chelsea fan. I've never been to Liverpool and I don't think I've been to City games. And I've been to, I've actually been to City. I went to Arsenal City many, many years ago. Like I think I was like 18 um, and I went to an Arsenal versus City game. I'm a football fan, guys. I love football. Um, mm. And also I'm doing some stuff in it and you lot will see in the future. But I don't know. I think, I think, I think City's going to smash Madrid. I think City are going to smash Madrid. Like they did wow. last last time, I think, I think Arsenal Bayern Munich is going to be an end to end game. I think mm -hmm. you know the I th I really think the nerves are gonna might get to Arsenal. I think like the because because people are talking about this fixture like obviously it's one of the biggest fixtures for, in Champions League right now. Um, yeah. And I also think that you know for Arsenal it's a very big fixture fix fixture for, for for them. But Bayern Munich for me, man, I'm not gonna lie. Eric Dyer in defense, nah. Anyone that got Eric Dyer in their centre back line, I just I'm not buying it. You get you're gonna lose. Kevin Jay looks solid though, you know. He's been benched. He's been, He's been benched. benched. He's been benched for Eric Dyer. Thomas Tuchel has benched Kim Min Jay for Eric Dyer. Um, and it's that's also, the worst manager ever, by the way. That, that and, I, and I've seen people saying they want Thomas Tuchel at United because he's Ugh, proven, yuck. he's a proven Champions League winner, and he's literally just been bullied by Bayer Leverkusen and Xavi Alonso who's doing a great job but he's yeah, been yeah. bullied by them in the German league yeah, they yeah, possibly yeah. Leave, finish the season trophyless um, but it'll be very interesting I think I think it's going to be two good games of Champions League I think this Champions League uh, quarterfinals is going to be it's going to be finally interesting because Champions League has not been that interesting this That's season true. That's except, except for United and, and I'm not going to lie guys as much as I like Musiala um I can't support Bayern Munich because then they, they, they battered us. Yeah. They, they, they battered us in the Champions League, and, and I'm obviously not. I'm just there to watch for moral support. I'm, I'm watching Musiala for moral support. That's it, man. But you guys know what it is. Be sure to hit the like button. Uh, be sure to subscribe. Eid Mubarak to everyone mm. that's celebrating Eid tomorrow. Um, uh, today's the last day of Ramadan, so I hope you have a great last day of fasting. 30 days gone just like that. But like I said, Eid Mubarak to everyone. Kulli amu antum bakhair. Taqbulallah minam minkum. I hope you all have a wonderful Eid that you spend with your family. I'm going to try my best to do a stream tomorrow, but there's no guarantee, guys. No guarantee. I'm going to try see if I can squeeze in a show earlier in the day, um, especially before the Champions League stuff as well. But big up to everyone. Be sure to hit the like button. Be sure to subscribe. Marcel, let them know where they can find you uh, online. Yeah, Marcel eleven or ten on on Twitter. Uh, moments of Marcel on on TikTok, and I think that's it. Really, I'm got I got to start up a channel like I keep saying, so that will come up soon. Guys, just make sure every time you see Marcel on a stream, just say Marcel, where's the channel? Where's the channel? Where's the channel? Because he's he's not gonna start it otherwise. He's just not <laughs> gonna start it. Uh, but big up to everyone. Be sure to hit the like button on your way out. We're only three off from hundred, so be sure to hit the like button if you haven't. I will be back hopefully tomorrow. If not on Thursday, man, you lot know what it is. As always, it's Marcel. It's Minna. We're out. Peace. Thank you.